Okay, so we're on video tutorial slash playthrough number three of the Talos F200i STEM. So in this video, we are going to cover performing EDS while operating in STEM mode. If you haven't looked at the video on STEM mode operation, I encourage you to take a look at that first. I will put a link in the description box below as well. So the whole idea behind doing EDS in STEM mode is that by doing EDS in STEM mode, you can perform spatially resolved EDS analysis. So that means doing things like point analyses, line scans, and as you see here in these two side-by-side -side images, so the left is a STEM image and the right is an EDS map of five different elements taken from that same area. And so that's what you can do in STEM mode that you can't do in conventional or fixed beam mode. So we're going to go over how to do all this uh, with the Talos while operating in STEM mode. So the process starts with configuring the instrument for operation in STEM mode with some notable adjustments that we'll get into. You obviously could perform STEM and EDS using STEM mode at 80 or 200 kilovolts, but 200 kilovolts obviously will give you better spatial resolution. So we're going to configure the instrument for 200 kV STEM operation. Again, select the STEM FEG register. And just like in the video on STEM operation, basically the only two things we need to do, maybe there's more than a couple, but we need to obviously find the specimen. So this is a fib lamella. You can see the TEM grid here or Omniprobe grid, I should say. And then right there, you can see the lamella in that V notch on that post. And we switched from LM into M mode. I'll just reuse the joystick here to recenter the lamella. Then we'll go into SA mode and now we can set eucentric height. So this is just like described previously. Press eucentric focus while in SA mode. And then use your Z axis buttons. Again, these are both on the right hand panel to minimize contrast of the image. I apologize, the contrast in the video is a little extreme at the moment. The other thing I'm going to do with this specimen is just like in the stem video is to get a rough zone axis alignment. So this is a single crystal and by getting a rough zone axis alignment that will ensure that I am performing my EDS parallel to the layered direction of the specimen. So again, I just went into diffraction mode, I'll use my alpha beta controls on my left hand panel just to align the zone axis roughly. I will do this also once I go into stem mode. The image looks out of contrast. You can adjust it with the Z because we didn't do a whole lot of tilting. We don't really need to do that, so we won't. And so now we will go into STEM mode. So we'll go to the STEM tab, STEM imaging, and select the STEM button. Once we go into STEM mode, we now have to manually select the spot size we want to use. I'm going to select spot size 1 here. So the lower the number, the more current you're going to get. Obviously, that's going to make your beam bigger. But as we'll see here, with the settings we're going to use here, spot size one and 
an appropriately sized C2 aperture, we can get a beam that's about a nanometer. So now we're just doing the stem alignment. So now I'm just defocusing the Ronchigram so I can see the specimen. And I'm navigating to some E-beam deposited platinum, which is great to do stem alignment on. So I'm using the focus knob to blow up the Ronchigram. And now I'm going to switch my C2 aperture to the largest one. And now we'll do the rest of the stem alignment as previously described. So we can see a little asymmetry in the rings. So we'll activate the condenser stigmators and then use the multifunction knobs to get those rings circular. I'm also going to turn off those recognition marks or centering marks on the flu cam just to make this a little easier. And then the next step is the rotation center intensity alignment in direct alignments. So you can see as I'm pulsing the focus, the Ronchigram is not expanding concentrically. So now I'm using my multifunction knobs. I bottomed out the sensitivity, just hit that minus button above the left knob a few times. Okay, so I made it worse. It's expanding up into the left. Make a few more little adjustments here. It looks pretty good right there. So then we'll select done and direct alignments. And now we can insert a 70 micron C2 aperture. You could use a bigger C2 aperture than this that will give you more current in the probe. It will also give you a bigger probe. So there is a trade off to doing it. But I'm going to use the 70 micron, which is the ideal sized one for doing high resolution stem. And it could also be used for doing stem for EDS as well. And again, I'm just centering it on the point of expansion and contraction of the Ronchigram. And then I'll deselect adjust in the apertures control panel. And now all I have to do is set the camera length back to a lower value, which I'll use 98 millimeters here, reinsert the stem detector. And now we will go to Velox and acquire a stem image. Before we do that, though, I'm just going to use diffraction alignment in the direct alignments control panel to center the direct disk of the seabed pattern in the detector rim. Now I will go to Velox and select Hadif. Again, I'm in the acquisition portion of Velox, and we can see the stem image. And again, you always need to make your final stigmation and focus adjustments using the stem image. So I'm going to navigate back to the E-beam deposited platinum because that will work really well for doing the focusing and stigmating. So you can see here clearly as I'm focusing, my little grains of platinum are kind of stretching back and forth. I will use the reduced area scan here in Velox to help with this. I'll activate my condenser stigmators and then I'm just adjusting these until my grains are non-astigmatic. This is much easier to do than atomic resolution because your margin for error is much less. Again, if I go back and forth here, I'm looking for any sort of streaking as the image goes in and out of focus and now I don't have any. So I will turn off the reduced area scan and then I can mag out and navigate around. So that bright sort of mushroomed shape thing, that's actually the gate structure of this device. And that area to the left right underneath it is my area of interest that I'm going to use. So I actually want to get that area on zone axis. So I'm going to stop the live stem image and then drag the marker and position it there and then look at my seabed pattern. And it is a little bit off zone axis there. So I am going to go to my alpha beta tilt controls on my left hand control panel to 
adjust this. So this is an iterative process. You're going to tilt. The sample might move a little. You'll have to go back to the live stem image, reposition the beam, then tilt some more. If the image starts to get out of focus while you're tilting, which we will see happen here in a minute, then you need to refocus it by adjusting the Z-axis buttons on the right-hand panel so we get back to eucentric height, like so. Once again, freeze the image, use the marker, and we can see we're still a little bit off. Again, I do apologize. That contrast is a little bit saturated. That's just a limitation of doing this on my phone. But we will go ahead and continue to zero in. You don't want this to be grossly off. We're not doing anything that's atomic resolution, so this doesn't have to be super precise. If we were doing atomic resolution imaging, this would be more critical, but it's just good practice to do it anyway. Again, you want to make sure if you're analyzing any type of interface that your beam is running parallel to the interface. And by making sure we have zone axis alignment, then we know we will have that. Again, zone axis alignment will vary along the specimen because the specimen probably has some bending to it. So just because you dial it in in point A doesn't mean it will still be dialed in when you go to point B. So here I'm using the Z-axis buttons again just to refocus the image after the tilting. And now what I'm going to do is adjust the scan rotation so that interface there is running perfectly vertical because that's just going to make my mapping and particularly my line scans a little more intuitive. So I'm just adjusting the scan rotation and using a square annotation just as a reference. And once this is dialed in, you can just select the annotation tool and then delete then move your area of interest to the middle of the image. And then you can mag in and focus in your area of interest. So you can see it's a little bit blurry. And there we go. Basically perfect now. So right now, Velox has control of the stem scanning. So we actually need to turn that over to the EDS software. So we have to go back to the stem imaging panel in microscope control, expand that little arrow in the right corner. And in the scan tab, we can change the scan input to external. You're going to get an error message in Velox if you're scanning, which isn't a problem. And now we can go to Esprit 2. And now that has control of the stem. So first thing is, of course, to insert your EDS detector in the spectrometer configurator. Once this is done, you can configure the energy range for the spectrometer, either 20 or 40 keV max. I'm just going to leave it at 20. That's usually sufficient. And now over on the left side of the window, we see the options for the modes for the system. So this one I'm circling here, that's for point analysis. So you can go ahead and select it. Then you can select that preview button there and you see a live stem image acquired now in the EDS software. You can turn on the scope just like you did in Velox, but now you're using Esprit 2 for this. If you need to adjust your contrast brightness, go back to the stem detector control panel in microscope control, and you can activate the multifunction knobs in that using that control panel, and then you can adjust the scope in the preview image in Esprit. 
And once you have your preview image configured, you can go ahead and close that window. And then you can select capture. I'm just making sure it's set on single using that pull down arrow and that will acquire the reference stem image used for the mapping or in this case point analysis I should say because that's what we have selected. So I'm going to go to the scan configurator now and verify that drift correction is enabled. That's that little box with the two arrows. Just make sure that it's outlined in red. If I click the downward pointing arrow and then drift correction, I can set up the configuration for drift correction. So I have it set to drift correct every 10 seconds right now. And now under the stem image, you see these different shapes. Those are the different ways you can collect points. So you can do individual points. You can draw boxes, you can draw ovals slash circles, and you can also draw polygons here. Then select Select All. If you push that downward facing button on Acquire, you can configure how you want the acquisition to go. Just to save time, I'm going to set it to Acquire for 15 live seconds for each of those analysis points and then I'll select acquire so it will do these in the order that you drew them so you notice I didn't mention anything about surveying in stem so really if you draw a box like we're doing now that is like doing a survey you're just doing it over a smaller area than you're imaging so it's kind of redundant to go over that in stem mode you can do it analogously to how it's done in TEM mode as well, but I'm not going to go over that because it's basically the same thing and you can do it effectively the same way using point analysis mode. So you can see as each spectrum is done acquiring it will populate in that list underneath the spectrum window the system will attempt some sort of auto ID, which we discussed in the general operation playthrough. It's essentially the same thing. And there's the third spot done. And there should be one more, which is that polygon area I drew over the bright region, which again is the gate. You can, of course, manually stop it before then. If you select stop, that used to be the acquire button. But I'm just going to let this complete here. All right, so this is almost done. When this is done, we're going to start talking about processing and working with the data. What it's a good idea to do is to go back to Velox, as we'll see here in a moment, and blank off the beam so it's not hitting the sample. So go back to the acquisition portion of Velox and just use the icon from the toolbar to blank off the beam. And then we can go back to Esprit and the first thing we want to do is send this to the project. So there's that double arrow in the upper right corner. And then you can send to project. And then if we open that folder in the project configurator, we see there's an image entry. That is your image. You can use that 
input output icon, which again is the two arrows to save that image. And then we can select spectra under the folder in the project configurator and we see all four spectra superimposed in one window. You can deselect spectra to only show certain ones that you have checked. And then manipulating this is just like outlined on the general operation playthrough video. You can remove elements, you can do auto IDs, you can manually identify peaks and manually add transitions as part of the peak labels. So here I'm just showing how to do that for this beta peak for the gallium K. And just really quickly, I'll show you how to do this for another peak. Again, you can click and drag on the X axis to move it. Use the scroll wheel to expand, contract. Left click and drag on the Y axis as well to expand, contract. Just checking out that little peak there to the left of the gallium L. And I only have one spectrum on here, so if I add another from the list below, then I will see both of them on there. And again, you can manually add peaks as well for those. I believe when you do auto ID on this, it only auto IDs the spectra or spectrum, I should say, that you have activated. So that's a gold peak. So saving in the data now, whichever one of those you have selected in the list, if you go to that input output button, you can do the first save option for saving the raw data. The second one will save an image of the spectrum window. And that is basically how to do point analysis. So now we're going to go back to Velox, unblank the beam. Go back to Esprit, and now we will switch to line scan mode. We will restart the preview here. And I will adjust the magnification up. So we're going to do a scan going left to right. There's a bunch of layers you can see there, including one that's really faint, that faint dark layer in the middle there. 
which we will see we can resolve with EDS. And then we can select Capture to acquire our reference stem image. There is a line drawn automatically on the image, which we will adjust in a minute. If you go now to the scan configurator and select that downward pointing arrow, we still have drift correction activated. The only thing we need to verify here is the dwell time for the line scan, which is 256 microseconds. And then if we select drift correction, we can see that we're configured to perform corrections every 10 seconds. So now we can just click and drag on that line and position it however we want. So I'm trying to keep the line perfectly horizontal. And because I oriented the image with those interfaces running up and down, I can get a nice orthogonal scan. You can see under the spectrum a sort of close-up area of the image where the scan will be taking place. So there's really, if you look at it, kind of five distinct layers there that we're scanning over. So once you have the line positioned accordingly, you can choose how many points are in the line. So you can see above that reference image or that close-up of the reference, you can see how long the line is, and you can then also input how many points are in the line. So obviously you can do the math and figure out the spacing between the points. So just as a, a tip, whenever you're doing any kind of EDS, um, there's really no benefit to using a point spacing that's smaller than about half of your probe size. So in this case, our probe is about a nanometer, so there's no point in using anything really much smaller than half a nanometer. So that's how I have the point number selected based on the length. So then we can go to acquire. I like to leave this in manual mode because then I can stop it manually and then just select acquire and then it will start generating the scans. So when you're in manual mode, this will continue to acquire the line scans until you stop it. It will do an automatic ID initially and generate the scans for those auto ID'd elements. What I'm doing here is just checking the drift correction status. It kind of shows you how it works. It's not otherwise terribly important. We can manually configure now what elements come into the scan. So we can select that periodic table icon next to the line scans, and then we can add or remove elements. So we will remove molybdenum, for example, because that's just from the grid. And then we can add some other ones. So we can add aluminum. So basically, to the left of that dark line that's vertical, that is gallium nitride and aluminum gallium nitride. So I added in nitrogen there. You see the nitrogen signal is kind of weak just because nitrogen doesn't like to make x-rays too much. But let's add in oxygen. So you can actually see. So on the bottom there, you can see those are the individual scans. If I want to change the color, there's a little color square. If I click on each of those, I can change my colors accordingly. Red, blue, green should always be your first three. After that, it's kind of wishy-washy as to what the convention is. I think I'm using magenta and then like a teal color. Yellow doesn't show up too well. But you can see in that individual oxygen scan that there is a spike in the oxygen signal at that dark line. And that oxide is only about two nanometers thick, so we can spatially resolve it using spectrum imaging. So I changed it to orange here just to make it a little easier to see. And this scan will again run because we're in manual mode as long as we let it run. If you want to add or remove elements, just uncheck the check mark next to that color square and that will remove them from the composite view or add them depending on if it's checked or not. So 
So depending on the specimen, your beam conditions and all that, it might take a couple minutes to get good signal to noise in your line scans. Uh, depends on your, your individual system. This is not a particularly fancy EDS detector. It's only a single panel with relatively small size, so it's not particularly efficient. Uh, some things we can do here, if you expand that little settings button on the bottom right of the composite line scans, you can actually do some smoothing to the line scans to sort of make them look smoother, of course. This works better the more points you have in the line. At some point, you start to artificially smooth things out. You can change the y-axis to make it logarithmic instead of linear. I tend to like it just in its raw state like that, but that is one option you have to process it if you wish. And so again, this will run basically until you tell it to stop, or since we have drift correction enabled, until you run out of drift correction. And if that happens, the system will automatically stop the scan. When you're ready, of course, to stop it, just select Acquire, and then the scan will stop. So we've got some pretty good signal here, and that was only a couple minutes to do the scan. Okay, so we just stopped it. And then, again, you should blank the beam once you're done and ready to do some fudging with the data. I didn't do that here, but I should have. And so I will go ahead and we'll use that input output button to send to the project and then we can do some manipulating. So you can select that folder that is from the line scan and then you can open the image. You can see the image with the line scan that you can then save. If you then expand underneath it, you can see the sum spectrum, which again can be manipulated, exported as done previously. Uh, I would like to state though that you have to be sure before you stop the scan, make sure you have all your elements selected you want in the line. You can also see that reduced area. And now if you right click on the composites, you can then save the line scans in a raw data format if you want to replot them. If you want to save the um, image of the line scans, you can select that input output button in the upper right corner, and that will save an image. Again, this will save an image of the composite. If you want to save the images of the individual line scans, just right click on each one and select save, and you can save the individual images that way. You can also manipulate the scale of the composite by clicking and dragging using the scroll wheel just like you would for a spectrum. All right, so now we're going to move to mapping. So we'll go ahead and select the mapping option from the left side of the window, and then we will select preview to get a preview image and we will set our magnification. So now the thing to keep in mind with mapping is that the pixel size in the stem image is what governs the pixel resolution of your map. And I'll show you how to adjust that here. Obviously higher magnification means smaller pixel size. We can actually see what this pixel size is once we finish previewing, and then we go back and do a capture. You can focus the image while you're using preview mode in the Esprit software, but this can be a little bit tricky. So you may find it more 
useful to actually give control back to Velox and do this that way. And giving control back to Velox is fairly easy to do. You just go back to the stem imaging control panel in microscope control and then expand the flap out which we already see we have expanded and then go to that scan tab and then change your scan input back to internal and then if you go back to the acquisition portion of Velox and you start view mode you can then focus your image and this should be a little easier than trying to do it in Esprit using preview mode. Again, when you're done, select view, change your scan input back to external, and then go back to Esprit, and then you can restart the preview and the focus should be perfect. And then when you're ready, you can select capture to capture your reference stem image. And now what you want to note here is it shows the pixel size of the stem image right there toward the bottom and that is going to be your pixel resolution of your map. So now if you go to the scan configurator the dwell time will be the dwell time used for a map, the dwell time for the image and then you can open up drift correction and we can see here we have drift correction settings for taking maps Drift correction is particularly important when you do a map more so than the other two analyses. And you can select acquire. Again, it's best to use manual mode for this. We have the yellow box here. You can click and drag, position that however you want. The number of points in the box, of course, is just the number of pixels that you're sampling over or acquiring from in the image. And then select acquire. So this is very, very similar to what you would do for a line scan. You could just think of this as like a map as an array of line scans. So it's going to acquire a reference stem image. It will do an auto ID and then it will start generating maps for the auto ID elements and the peaks that it is choosing to use for the auto IDing. So again, we can select that little periodic table icon choose which elements we want to keep or get rid of. We'll get rid of molybdenum, for example. Again, that's from the grid. And we'll get rid of neon because there's no neon. And then we'll add in the same elements we used in the line scan plus silicon. And we'll also yep, we'll put oxygen in there. Okay, so basically the composite that you're seeing has the reference stem image and all the maps superimposed. So by unchecking any of those, you take them out of the composite. So I just took out the stem image and then put it back. So it's a little easier to see when you remove the stem image. Again, you can change the color for each map by just selecting that little color square and then selecting a new color. Again, red, green, blue should be your primary colors. And then after that, it's again kind of wishy-washy as to what you should use. But ultimately, we should be able to see all of those distinct regions, including that thin oxide there that's running vertically that we're getting in about the upper half of the mapped region. So mapping times tend to be a lot longer than line scans, definitely, depending on your system. Again, this isn't an extremely efficient EDS detection system we have. It has a relatively small solid angle, so you have to count for a fairly long time. 
So it's not uncommon on a system like this for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes before you get a decent map with enough signal to noise present. Again, that depends on the specimen, depends on a bunch of other factors. Um, on some newer systems, well, this is a newer system, but on some more advanced systems with better EDS uh, detectors, this can be a matter of a few minutes only before you have some really high quality maps. And I'm just going through here and changing the colors. So that actually looks pretty good there. You can see now the uh, different regions fairly clearly as delineated by the different colors. And again, you, I can turn some on and some off. So now I just have aluminum. Well, now I don't have aluminum. Now I put it back in. You notice in some cases I'm seeing some signal where I'm not expecting to have that element present. That's actually because I'm getting a background x-ray signal there. That's not because the element actually is there. That's actually a topic of discussion for another video about interpreting your EDS results and understanding things like that. So you don't think I've got silicon in my gold or I've got oxygen in my gold, so on and so forth. You can select that settings icon to the lower right side of the map, the composite map, and then you can add or remove the legend and scale bar just to kind of clean it up if you want to draw it in later. And then you can also do smoothing just like you did with the line scan. This tends to be a little more dramatic here when you do it on a map. So with the maps, the smoothing tends to not work as well, at least aesthetically. In my opinion, it's better to just use the, you know, the raw, uh, unprocessed, unsmoothed map. It tends to work a little bit well with line scans, mostly because you get better signal to noise in a line scan than you do in a map because your individual signal on a pixel to pixel basis in a map is typically very low. So I typically don't like to use any sort of smoothing with a map. So we'll just leave it raw here. So I apologize for not going over this in the line scan portion. The process is the same, but you can use different peaks for your maps or line scans very easily. So right now it's using basically auto selected peaks for each element that you can see here based on each peak. There's a window that it's using. We don't have any overlaps right now, so this really isn't a problem. But if you had an overlap, you might want to change the peak that's being used. So let's say we want to use a different peak for the gallium, which is that one outlined in the green. So that peak right there is actually the gallium K beta. Uh, you wouldn't want to do this because that's much weaker than the alpha and there's no overlap, but just for demonstrative purposes, you can then just open up the gallium list, just double click on it. You'll pull up the gallium menu and then in your spectrum regions list, you can select to use K beta, and that will then map the K beta signal instead of the K alpha signal. So you can now see that down there. You will have to change the color back, unfortunately. Again, you only want to do that if you have a reason to do it, mostly because you have an overlap between peaks. That's kind of the primary reason why you might want to do that. I'm going to go ahead and change it back though because the alpha peak had far more signal in it. So that's the one that we would want to use. But that's just an example of how you can do it.
So we'll let this run for a few more minutes. Again, if I was doing this for real, I would probably let this run a lot longer. But this is just a demonstration, obviously. Longer the better, more signal to noise, or again, until your drift correction runs out. Uh, the higher you go in mag, the more susceptible you're going to be to that, especially if your sample is moving around a lot and it's not settled. Here I'm just fudging with turning certain elements on or off. But you can see those dark region, or that dark line, is resolved in the map, and that's only a couple nanometers thick. So that gives you an idea of what you can do with an EDS map, and of course you can do better with that, or then that, with a more advanced system. On the other TEM we got, we can actually do atomically resolved mapping, and I do look forward to presenting that once the system is ready for use. So again, once you're ready to stop the map, just select acquire, and then the map will stop, again, because we are in manual mode. And then you can select that input output icon in the upper right corner to send it to the project. So underneath your composite map, you'll see some shape icons that you can draw on your composite map and you can actually use those to isolate the EDS spectrum from those pixels. So I drew a square there and you can see now I have both the sum spectrum and the isolated spectrum from the box that I drew. So we can see how in the boxed area, I don't have any uh, gold peak, which makes sense because there's no gold over there. And we can do this again. I'm going to draw an oval in that red area, which I know is mostly nickel. And again, we see decreases in certain peaks. We see an increase in the nickel peak, obviously, because we've got mostly nickel there. If you pull up that periodic table icon, you can do an auto ID, but you have to be careful because if you do that, it's going to rebuild the map based on the auto ID. So if you already had that set up, it will all be washed out, and then you may have to redo it to put it back how you wanted it, including fixing the colors again. So just be careful with that. If you choose to do an auto ID when you are done. So I'm going to go ahead and do this manually. Just go back to select map there and select a little periodic table. Right now we only have one element. And then we can just go to the table of elements. Just clear everything and then you can manually add in the elements that you want. Again, unfortunately, you're probably going to have to then go back and 
reset the colors that you had before. So if I go to that mapping folder in the project panel on the right, there's a few items in there. So there's the image, that's the stem image that shows where I did the maps from that I can save accordingly with that input output button. If I select the map option from that folder, that shows the maps as I had them when I exported them to the project, but now I can't save directly from this window, unfortunately. And then that's the sum spectrum as well. So obviously we want to know how to save the maps. So we'll go ahead and do that, go through how to do that. It's a little bit trickier than it should be, but it's not too bad. So what you have to do is click and drag the map from the mapping folder under your project tab and then drag it onto the working area. And now unfortunately, you will have to go and reconfigure the colors. They don't transfer over from as you saved them when you did the add to project, but that's fairly simple to do. And now you can export them from here so we can see the original color scheme here that looks much better than the other one. So we can just go ahead and quickly rearrange the colors here, which only takes a couple changes here. And then we are ready to go. Again, you can pull up that little settings dialog box and you can remove the scale bars and legend if you want. You can also add in the averaging if you want. Again, I don't like doing that for the maps. So if you want to save the individual maps, just right click on one of them and you can do save and that will save the individual maps, all of them that are listed there. As far as the composite is concerned, go ahead and select that input output icon in the upper right corner, and then you can select save. If you don't want certain elements in the composite, you can just deselect them and then again select that input output icon and then save. And then that version will get saved. I would also like to stress that at least on this particular software configuration, we do not have the ability to go back and rebuild the maps. So you do have to make sure you have all the elements and selected peaks chosen before you save the map because you can't go back and rework it, unfortunately, with the software build that we have on other ones. You probably can do this depending on, again, your software configuration. All right, so at this point when you're done, we can go ahead and retract the EDS detector, go to that spectrometer configurator, select the detector position icon, and the detector will retract. So this is just like basically finishing up in STEM mode after the detector is out. And then we want to go back to Velox, go ahead and unblank the beam, 
set your scan rotation back to zero degrees. And then you want to go back to that scan tab in that flap out in stem imaging and return control back to internal. And that's it. You can do stem imaging at this point. You can go out of stem mode. It's entirely up to you. And uh, so that completes the performing EDS while operating in stem mode demo.